Morning, everybody. We got live audio, it looks like. We'll have video in just about uh, 26 seconds. Say hello to a new friend. Yeah, you just popped up there. Everybody. We got live audio, it looks like. Yeah, we'll have down. video in just about uh, 26 seconds. Truck. Well, how's everybody doing this beautiful morning? Doing We're here better. with uh, Katie Kentner at the uh, Mojave Museum of History and Arts. Another beautiful day in Kingman, Arizona. Beautiful fall weather, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was fall. It feels it's like lovely. fall. So. Miss Katie, uh, you've got yourself quite a job here yeah. at the museum. Uh, Kind of envious you get to poke around in all the goodies and everything that turns up here. Well, we do our best. So, I've been here a little over a year. And I just fell into this job, literally. Um, I did it by volunteering at the Mojave Museum here in the library. Yeah. And uh, it turned out that they hadn't had a curator for a while. And when they heard about uh, my background working in libraries for 20-odd years, I thought that, and that I also, I like to nose around in vintage and antique items and so on, that uh, maybe I could do that job. And so I kind of just moved in there. And they started paying me, <laughs> which was nice. It's always nice to get paid yeah. for something that you enjoy doing. I do enjoy it. I've, I've been working on a big project now to uh, clean up some of the records, and in the process I got to go through a lot of the uh, old boxes back in uh, the upper storeroom. And I've spent quite a bit of time down in the lower storeroom, too, so I've got to know a little bit about what's in those boxes and what's downstairs. I'm still working on it. There's still sur lots of surprises, but uh, I've dug out a few things we're going to talk about today. Um, I don't. Do you want me to go ahead and just? Yeah. Well, what, well we, this uh, is kind of intriguing. Uh, your is, circus wagon. This yeah. is a um, scale model of a uh, Hagenbeck Wallace circus wagon. It's a lion cage wagon. It was built. The original was built, I think, in the 30s or late 20s. Um, Hagenbeck Wallace is uh, that circus is well known for being in a terrible, terrible train wreck in 1918. And mm. f over 50 people died in that. And a lot of them didn't have names uh, because they just, when you run away to work at, you know, go work at the circus, you don't give anybody a real name, no. really. So uh, they are uh, something like 56 people uh, buried in, uh, I can't remember, I wish I could remember the town. I believe, I believe it was in Indiana. And it's called the Showman's Rest is the cemetery where they're, they're buried in a mass grave. But each one has its own coffin. But this uh, wagon, as I said, it, it uh, postdates that. Um, it still exists. Um, this one here we've got now is a, it's one inch to one foot scale model. It was built by a uh, fellow in uh, Golden Valley. Uh, his name is Charles Bauer. I'm not sure if he's still with us or not, but it came in uh, a while back and we're still deciding what exactly to do with it because we're not known for being a circus museum, but at the same time, it is built by someone local. And the wagon itself does have a little, uh, the, main, the real wagon does have a little history in Arizona. At one time, it was owned by uh, somebody from Buckeye, because it has been passed around a bit. It's been with different circuses and different collectors over the years. And I have a, a kind of an affinity for it because I grew up in Wisconsin, very close to the Circus World Museum. Oh, yeah, but Barnum & Bailey's. Uh... Well, Barnum & Bailey, actually, Barnum & Bailey has some items there, but Ringling Brothers. That's it. Yeah, was, okay. was was uh, the big circus that grew up in, in Baraboo. And the museum there has this wagon. Now, they've since pa it's been painted red. It's been red and white over the years, both colors. And so if you happen to see the movie Water for Elephants, it's in that movie. So hey. you can look at out for it. It's a three-arch wagon. There are lions in there, so you want to be careful around this. They haven't moved very much, so I don't think anybody's feeding them. 
Anyway, you, you know, I, it, I like this a lot. It's amazing. I've always admired craftsmen, whether they're building cars or anything. But but this, the detail in this, the little padlocks, uh, the chains, your uh, your double tree on the bottom Everything for for two for a uh, double team. It's all just right down to scale with this thing. And uh, the funny thing, I decided. Well, I'm gonna yesterday. I thought, well, I'm gonna make sure this isn't a kit. No. You know. I couldn't find any kit out there. There, there. You can find one for a railroad setup, but it doesn't look nearly as good as this one does. This one looks like you you could take a picture of it and it would look like the real wagon. So, um, anyway. One of the things I, you know, speaking of Wisconsin and these models, I was privileged uh, some years ago up in uh, Rolock, Minnesota, to attend um, one of the largest steam thresher reunions in the United States. And they had an elderly gentleman there. He was in his early 90s. And he had spent 35 years building a uh, scale model uh, steam tractor with a hay baler. And it was a little smaller than this. And it was a functional steam tractor with belt-driven hay baler. And it made one-inch hay bales. Wired the whole nine yards, spit out one-inch hay bales. Did he use it for a lawnmower or anything? <laughs> yeah, you know, just but just a little table model, and I just stared at that in disbelief that somebody it's could do. It's amazing what people do. Now this is not mechanical. And no, you, no, but you need a horse, a little miniature horse to pull it. I guess a couple of them. But yeah, I've 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 heard of things like that. People just dedicate their lives to doing this. And this guy, uh, Mr. Bauer, he did a splendid job on this. It's just absolutely beautiful. So. Uh, what do we want to do next? Uh, well, this is kind of you got my this has got my attention right okay. here. We've got markings on I'm this. I'm going to stand up a little bit for yeah. some of this. Got some nice markings on there. This is a for found, water. It's a foundling. Somebody scraping around. Same guy that found that piece of metal over there. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But he found this too, and it's uh, what we can surmise from it is that it's a uh, water gauge for rising water. What's what I was going to say? It looks like it's got hard water deposits mm -hmm. and. Yeah. So and the, I'm not going to say where it was found because we get in trouble for that. I'll just say it was found in Mojave County, and it wasn't found near a water source. That narrows it down pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you say that went with but this. But they have a long way to go for that. You say that. Now this, well, I'm going to talk about that and the, the uh, thing next to it because they're kind of related. These two? Yeah. Um, this... Well, these are neat. They look nice and comfortable. Well, they were. <laughs> I can. These are foundlings. Somebody found them out in a mining area. I think it was close to uh, the Golconda mine. And um, they are steel two inserts. What do you do when your boots all get worn out yeah. and you don't have time to run to the store and get some? You just you either go to the store and get some and make the time or... You cut out <laughs> another piece from metal and put that in your shoe. And this, that's what we surmise happened there. Well, that is really intriguing. Now, that's had leather over it, I'm sure. Uh, and, but that's what's left when it all rots away. I tried to figure that out. I thought, well, maybe somebody had some steel moccasins or something they were well, wearing. The, the but... soles of these look like they're factory made almost. Yeah, but this was... This, riveted and... I think the shoe itself, or the boot, actually rotted away. Can, and that's it, what was left. If anybody has ideas or suggestions, please free, feel free yeah. to chime in on this. But this is... Uh... I think they may have been replaced by steel-toed... And uh, mm -hmm. new new uh, materials kinds of things. So that is really fascinating stuff. Yeah, this was Can an you interesting. Imagine, that you know, wooden clogs is one thing, but steel clogs. That's now there's pretty, something well, different. When you're working in the mines, you need a lot of heavy protection, and I think that was probably somebody that worked in in the local mines. Uh, in fact, they, like I said, it was found near the Golconda mine. Um, and this was another place. So found not too far from the uh, gauge, and um, we think maybe it took us a while to figure this one out, but we think maybe a miner had to re do a quick replace and replacement in his shoes, and he just put it on the old metal cutter, and away he went. You know, we have forgotten a lot of this, but, you know, you used to have to just make do with things, and uh, I came in at the tail end of that, you know, a lot of those guys, but... Uh, I saw some pretty amazing things. I was working with uh, 
uh, Ed Edgerton up at Ed's camp when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I was too young to appreciate it, but we were up by Fig Springs, and uh, he had an old GMC or Chevy truck, lost the fuel pump. He had the old glass sediment bulb and never bothered him at all. He just uh, sat down, and we took the fuel pump off, laid it out on the running board. Then he took the spare tire apart to pull the tube out, and it was the rubber diaphragm in the fuel pump had come apart. There was about 15 little screws around the top. He took it apart and cut out a piece of the inner tube and stuck it in the fuel pump and put it back together, and that, we drove that thing into Kingman like that. Oh, gosh. You just I, you I had to do those that. things. You have to, you have to, you know, you used to have to learn to make do. I just got, I read, I just read a book recently, and I, as someone, I do recommend it for anybody who hasn't read it. It's called Deep Enough. It's by a fellow named Frank Crampton, who. The early 20th century, and he was also an assayer, and uh, he assayed gold. He went, he traveled for a while, but he started out in the mines. He came from an affluent family in New York City, like one of these Central Park people that would, had invested in mines and were making a lot of money. And they were just horrified when he decided he wanted to go be a miner. It's like, you might as well just go jump off a cliff, as far as they're concerned. But he has a, it's a great book. It has a lot of good stories and a lot of great information about both the history and uh, the techniques of mining back then and about the uh, areas where he worked. And one of those areas was in uh, chloride. Um, he had a pretty good good stories about chloride. He had a story about the Beale Hotel that was kind of crazy. Um, There's spending a lot of... Christmas Eve at the Beale Hotel. There's some crazy stories associated with that hotel. Yeah, this and he had he has some nutty ones from there. So, I recommend it to anybody. It's out there. It's on Kindle, and you can get a print copy too. So, should we go on to? What, what the... This is. Does that have an Andy Divine connection? By That's right. It sure does. This is Andy's, and it's Froggy, the Gremlin. Um, from. The show Andy's Gang. Yes, yes, yes. Now this is I. We we've been wondering if this is the real one or not. This is a rubber one, um, and I I think Andy might have had the real one, but it was also uh, the puppet was also designed by the previous host of the mm -hmm. show, Ed O'Connell. So it might be in his family too, and maybe Froggy was reproduced for Toy Stick. Um, anyway, this fellow was on Andy's Gang. Before that, it was the Buster Brown, I think it was called the Buster Brown Show or the Buster Brown Gang. I hate to admit it, but it's just a little before my time. It's, a, it's late, we're talking late 40s into the early 50s yeah, here. Definitely just a and, little uh, before me. It's We do have clips of it here on video. I took a look at it. It scared me to death. I didn't want to watch it. But Andy, when he took over, he took over when Ed O'Connell died. And uh, they were kind of uh, left with Froggy. And uh, what Andy did is instead of being in front of a peanut gallery of kids, mm -hmm. he would do his takes independently, and then they would intercut children's reactions and probably from previous shows. But he would do his thing with Froggy. And the thing with Froggy, if you wanted Froggy to appear, you had to yell, Plunk your magic twanger, Froggy. I can't tell you the images that brings up in my head, but um, then Froggy would appear in a puff of smoke, and he would go, hiya, kids, hiya, hiya, hiya. How many people are still in therapy over that? I don't know. <laughs> I would be, I think. But he was he was kind of a scary little goof. He was a prankster. He, uh, he made jokes a lot at people, other people's expense. Um, he would fit in real well with today's society, I think. Froggy would be really accepted, so... Anyway, this one came out of our case, and it, it was in pieces. Uh, if, this is Andy's. And uh, apparently, uh, I think maybe the kids at home played with it a lot, so we had to do some froggy repair with pipe cleaners. So that's what's holding them together right now. For those, you know, we got a, younger folks, pretty much anybody under, uh, uh, probably under 60, May not recognize Andy Devine, but you, Andy Devine was a character actor with a real gravelly, rough voice. Was in hundreds and hundreds of movies. Uh, he did the voice of Friar Tuck for um, Walt Disney's animated Robin Hood, uh, Mad 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 World, Stagecoach with John Wayne, just tons and tons of movies. of movies. And uh, 
In 55, they dedicated uh, on the program, This Is Your Life, they renamed Front Street in Kingman, Arizona, Andy Devine uh, Avenue, which is Route 66. And since we're talking about Andy Devine, well, I notice we have jingles here. There's jingles. I am not sh This came from Andy. Now, this is a pair of chaps. I'm going to move that chaps. wagon to slide it over a little bit. Keith you. can move it. You want to yeah. be very careful with that thing. Yeah, we don't need a televised disaster. No, we don't. So you can put it back on the wagon if you want. Or just set it over there. Uh, let's we turn the camera over there real quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, these are leather, green leather shafts. As this Midwesterner was corrected a while back. That's how you pronounce it. They're not chaps, they're shafts. And from what I am finding out about what we got when we got them we usually try to get a history that they were made for Andy Devine we don't know for sure if he wore them because the report said that he was he used them for a TV show called Jingles Yes. now anybody who was around at that time and watched Wild Bill Hickok knows that Andy Devine was on Wild Bill Hickok. And he played a character named Jingles Jones. And he was always, he was the guy at the beginning of the show that said, hey, Wild Bill, wait for me. So, and he was a big hit with kids. Yeah. And he was a big guy. I mean, he was pretty imposing, yeah. but he had such a big smile. He was always a jolly laughing yeah. kind of fella. Uh, he was always laughing. He had a huge smile. Kids really seemed to uh, gravitate to him. Yes. Um, but I can't find any evidence that it was actually worn no. by Andy. And it, it does not look worn at all. I believe, you know, from my opinion, it was maybe made by a fan and given no. to him as a gift. But it's beautiful. Yeah. Anybody out there has got any ideas? Then wouldn't it be neat to know if that was on the program or they not? They fit me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If anybody, excuse me. If anybody knows where these may have been used or worn, I would love to know about it because we'll add that to the history here in the museum. Uh, for right now, they're not on display, so this is going to be kind of rare to see them. We have them in the back room. We have them hanging out back there. We do have a lot of Andy Devine related material. And one thing I have noticed about uh, what we have from his, from his collection is that he was one of the most honored actors out there. He had, he was the, well, Johnny Carson used to joke about him being mayor of Van Nuys. Yes. But he was the honorary of M M Van Nuys for many years. Every year, this I guess they would give him that honor again. So it was something like 15 years he was he was ma the honorary mayor of Van Nuys. So, um, and lots of trophies, uh, lots of honorariums. He was the honorary mayor, mayor of a lot of different towns and everywhere he went. And of course, in Kingman, he was doubly honored all the time. Well, since so. Andy's not here this morning, so he can't refute this, but uh, Andy <laughs> and I have been discussing this about the uh, Andy Devine con connection with Will Rogers. We've been working on trying to find that. We, uh, there's a persistent story. I understand that, uh, I may be wrong, but if I recall this correctly, Will Rogers introduced Andy to his wife, Dorothy. That's the story. And uh, But we've got a couple guys that swear up and down that there was a New Year's Eve party at uh, the Hotel Beale, 32 or 33, and Will Rogers was here with well, Andy Devine. But there again, the rumor mill is, is rife with all kinds of great stories. She, I, in uh, working here, I've run across some notes from her and so on. She's, I, of course, I never met either one of them, but she sounds like she was absolutely a fabulous lady, just fabulous. And she kept in touch with people here in town. Uh, she wrote notes back and forth, and whenever he was going to appear here, Dorothy would be the one that would be doing the contacting of friends in the area and let them know and, and fix it all up so they could come. So, should we go on to this little yeah, thing? Yeah, what you got here? I don't have super a lot of information about it, but I do love it. It's beautiful. This is a um, seed bead belt that was made by one of the local Mojave 
Indians. Um, and the motif is, I don't know if anybody can see this, but it's poinsettias. Well, very good, um, a Christmas type uh, situation, well, possibly. You know, with Mojave Indians and Mexico is in close proximity, yeah. of course, and the poinsettias are from Mexico. Um, that, you know, it may be a very everyday thing for them. But I just thought it was real pretty, and it's a nice example of Native American beadwork, which is still going on today. That's a tradition that uh, has been carried on forever and ever. They used to um, uh, use, well, you remember if you're kids, you heard about wampum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They used wampum for trading. Well, wampum is a shell, and uh, it's not easy to work with. No, no, no. <laughs> so as trade became more prevalent back and forth across the country, even between uh, European-type settlers and, and uh, people from elsewhere, uh, the trade routes brought seed beads like these glass beads to the Native Americans here, and they began using a lot of a lot of seed beads in their bead making. I'm amazed by you know for such a small museum, the Mojave Museum of History and Arts is is just astounding. The collection that is on display, some of the things that are come in and out, and the things that are in the archives. I could have stripped the displays for a lot of interesting things, but it's, I didn't think that would be cool. I had to I had to really ask nicely to get Froggy. Well, and we'll get it. We've done this before. We'll come yeah. back again and we'll talk about the parrot's funeral, the parrot's headstone, and oh, Polly. Few, yeah, yeah. Polly had is an interesting story. I should have brought that up here, but no, uh, no. We'll save that for the next time. Yeah, we will. It's a it's a fun story. What do we got? in the box uh, well or who do we have in the box this is a seven and a half foot 107 pound mountain man oh yeah he was seven and a half feet and he was 107 pounds now he's just in a box now this fella, I have to, I might have to refer back to my notes real quick, but this fellow, oh here, I've actually put him on here, oh, lost a tooth, <laughs> gotta go to the dentist. This fellow was terrorizing ranches around here. Um, he was actually killed about 40 miles from Kingman mm -hmm. on a ranch out, out of, I think it was the Fort Rock Ranch, is that what it says here, did I got my notes? Um, he was killing cattle. And he was known to have killed 12 head of calves, which that runs into a lot of money. So um, they find, it took him 17 days to get this cat. Now, I like cats, and I'm really sorry <laughs> that he was eating yeah. cows. But I like to see mountain lions and things like that, you know, be left. It, it's surprised, it's a, it, it really would surprise people to know how much uh, the diversity of wildlife in this area, because when you drive through oh, Kingman on I-40 or 93 or Route 66, you know, it's a desert. But there's so much water in these hills and the diversity of climates, and uh, it is Look astounding how much wildlife is, is in this area. I got teeth on him. I don't know, like him, 107 pounds of cat come jump on your bed at night in the middle of the night. <laughs> That's a wake-up call. <laughs> and well, we've got to see what we've we got. We've got a couple other things. Let me move down here a little bit. And uh, this one, I don't know if everybody can see this. Yeah, I think we got that there. You ever Ooh. heard the uh, term, look it up in your Funkin' Wagnalls? This is fr that shows my eggs, doesn't it? From the laugh in, they said they... They seem to get a kick out of the name Funk and Wagon. Isn't that amazing? You know, you start to say things or do things, and you yeah. realize, I really am that old. It brings <laughs> you up short. I was over uh, at uh, covering an opening of an auto museum uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, one of their prize exhibits was a, was an AMC Pacer. And I was working oh on the, my gosh. I was working on those in the garage when those were out, and I thought, my gosh, am I that old? I'm a museum exhibit. Well, this belonged to Lewis Kingman. And uh, Lewis Kingman is the is uh, Kingman is named for Lewis Kingman. He was the engineer that uh, uh, the railroad survey engineer. did the railroad survey all through this area. I can't. I'm not an expert on Lewis Kingman, believe me. But I know he was a surveyor, and he developed the whole railroad system through here through Kingman from 
I can't remember how many. He worked in New Mexico. He worked in Arizona. He worked in California. No, King, so. Kingman, Kansas. You're in Kingman, Kansas. Is that uh, is that yes. any? Yeah, it mm -hmm. is named for him. So he must have been up there. <laughs> That's what we figured. Was that with the, the Atlantic and Pacific Railroad? That, that was the Santa Fe Railroad. Sail Santa Fe Santa Railroad. Santa Fe Railroad. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. still is the Santa Fe Railroad. This is called the BNSF now. It's a Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Right. But uh, it's still the Santa Fe. Back then, the Santa Fe Railroad built this town. And um, he was part of it. Uh, it's, it's just an interesting little thing. He's, he wound up in Mexico. He worked uh, for in Mexico City in the later part of his life. But we wound up with his his funk and wine mills. And we also have a button, one little button. But that I thought this would show better. Um, I'm just wondering how much he used this because it's really falling apart. Well, and, he uh, was, you know, books were so important to these people that I mentioned he just wore the, read the, right, read the writing right off the pages. I'm sure he did. And the t now someone has done a very bad repair to this. Do not do this to your books. No, no strapping tape, no scotch tape. There is proper, proper yes. material to repair a book. Well, you know, it's kind of like we were talking about with the shoes. You know, yeah. years ago, you, you, you patch things with what you There's had. There's a piece of it right there just came off. So. Pa patching, you know, with what you have. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what we do. What, that's what we did when we were kids. We used scotch tape and sure. everything to hold them together. But when you have something like this, it probably is worth at some point, if we ever find the money to do it, is send it out to a proper conservator who will put it back yes. together mm -hmm. a little bit. But, yeah, this was part of a display for a while. That's why we have the little placard here. So um, he was a civil engineer. Well, actually, he was working for the AMP Railroad, Atlantic and Pacific. Pacific. Okay. But the, uh, the um, see, I think Santa Fe because that's what came through here. But he uh, did uh, from uh, surveyed from Albuquerque to Mojave, California, and it was 915 miles of surveying. What, what, my understanding is that with the Atlantic and Pacific started started the railroad across through here, mm -hmm. and they went and broke one of the big projects that uh, they went belly up was the Johnson Canyon Railroad Tunnel outside of Ash Fork, and then uh, they became the Atlantic Pacific became uh, Santa Fe, uh, and then Santa Fe Burlington. Oh, close enough. Yeah, <laughs> it all it's like. <laughs> They all become something else. So yeah. I really miss the old Milwaukee Road myself. You know, I don't. Once in a while, you see one of their cars around, but you don't really see them around too much. Well, there, you know, a lot of the small railroads yeah. too. Like here, we had the Arizona Utah Railroad mm -hmm. Company that went connected Maconico with chloride. Uh, all these different little railroad companies and the Mojave Milltown Railroad up by Oatman. And there was a, wasn't there a railroad that connected Mineral Park to Kingman or? No. Uh, or but, it didn't get the railroad. Maybe that was the problem. Yeah. It was, uh, went out to chloride. We we're going to take it out to White Hills and they, they, they ran into financial troubles as well. So. Well, that's, that's <coughs> sad, but you know, life goes on. And then, yeah. then your newspaper up and moves out of town in the middle of the night and takes the city, the county government with it. Some of these stories are so <laughs> wild, you just can't make it up. But they used to just do things different. Yeah. You know, I mean, they just used to they do did. things different. But they got it done. Yeah. And there wasn't any shilly-shallying around with it. There was no debate, no pol no politics. Let's just go. <laughs> yeah, let's <laughs> just, go. yeah, we just do it. So we've got one more thing on the table here, and then I want to talk about that big thing over there. Um, in this era of political correctness, uh, certain things have sort of fallen by the wayside. And this actually, in World War II, remember the Nazis adopted the swastika. Yes, yes. As their symbol. Now, it's uh, actually has kind of uh, taken that symbol out of its context. It was uh, originally, some people call it tumbling logs, others call it swirling logs. But it was used in a lot of decoration, blankets and jewelry and so on, by Native Americans, Europeans, and so on. And this is a copper cuff, an arm cuff. We think this is for our upper arm. It doesn't fit my upper arm, but... Um, and I know people can't really see it too much, but it is decorated with what we would call today swastikas, uh, both around the top and around the other, the other side of it. Um, to me, that's, that's really sad. Uh, in um, history, in fact, not too long ago, somebody was uh, selling at a flea market. They had a, an Indian blanket, 
that was decorated with swastikas. It was a big red one, but it was it was tumbling logs is what it was. And people began protesting and, and threatening the seller without, you know, if you go ahead and do this without any knowledge of the history of the symbol, you can get people in real trouble because are we supposed to blank this all out? Well, this is there again. Ignorance is not always bliss. In no, it, it isn't. But the swastika situation, you know, is a Native American uh, emblem, but uh, it was also used because it was associated with the Native Americans before World War II. It was an important part of Arizona's tourism and development. Uh, I know of two highway bridges in Arizona that were built probably in the 20s that have the swastika in the concrete on the on, mm -hmm. on the pillars, and uh, you know, just it's different context. Yeah, I had. Uh... I used to wait, I lived in Madison, Wisconsin for years, and I used to wait for the bus down uh, on a building, by a building um, just off the Capitol, just two mm -hmm. blocks. Uh, and I happened to look down one day as I'm waiting for my bus, and it had a beautiful mosaic la uh, landing in front of the door. Landing, I don't know what they call it. The thing that you step on to get to the door. And it was edged with swastikas. And I uh, and I just, I, it very much confused me at the time. And I, you know, realized this building predates World War II. So Sorry, apparently the swastika means something else. Please try again in a moment. Oh, no. Are we in trouble? That's yours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's me? Yeah. Well, I phoned it. This Shut is up. really interesting stuff. And, you know, it's just like, like with pillowcases. Pillowcases are not offensive. Well, there's, there's a group of people that's made pillowcases with holes in them very offensive, but you can't get upset over pillowcases it's no just, you can't it's, you it's, know, it's uh if it, if you go around with a pillowcase with holes in it on your head you're going to get tr in trouble that's yeah. all there is to it unless it's halloween and you're a ghost so we got one more thing to look at well actually two more and this came in oh a few weeks ago small child saddle isn't it? this is a well it's a ranch saddle just, that's what i'm told with the biggest horn on the dang saddle I've ever seen. Uh, it's built into the pommel. This is not something that was added later. This is carved into the pommel. But this saddle is a nice little de oh, demonstration no. of the construction of a saddle. Uh, Tim Woods, uh, of the Mojave County Fairgrounds director, he has uh, uh, over a hundred uh, year family history of uh, saddle making. And he was showing me the history of these over the years, That how this the, the back and no, your, in your, developed, how yeah. your tree developed yeah. over the years of this. I sure wore a lot of leather off the tree in my, when I was younger. That's how I made my living, polishing leather with the seat of my pants. <laughs> well, this one got cooked in a, in a barn for several decades, from what yeah. I understand. But the curious thing about the horn is that it's, we surmise that it was a roping and ranching yeah, you can see sand, it. you know, where She's it's been rubbed in. into, and it was carved as part of the pommel. This was not a later addition. No. So um, it has been cooked pretty good. But another thing, and I'm going to set this down on the floor. If everybody got a good look at this thing, I could have picked it up. So, um, yeah, on the chair, thank you. Is that it came in with this. Now, I'll have to pick it up. It's kind of crumbing. This is a saddle rack that somebody made. And it then it shows you the ingenuity of... What you when you need it, find a way to make it. Yeah. I love the. And it actually has an extra little little shelf down here to keep whatever on here, maybe another saddle or something, or, but it's a little low for that. But yeah, just go out to the woods, pick yourself up some sticks. You and, make uh, make what you need. Just make it, and it works just fine. There's a there's a place uh, out by the the steel plant out behind McConaughey. Uh huh. Well, that's something we should do as a field trip sometime, but uh, I don't even know how you'd get there now. The last time I was there was before the steel plant. But back in there, there was, uh, was a bunch of, like, a valley of rocks. It's just all these rocks piled. There's an artesian well that they've dammed up. But in the 1930s, during the Depression, people set up a camp back there that were working, uh, dry washing, panning, doing different things. And uh, they built little homes in the rocks. And one of the most amazing ones that I found out there was a little uh, room... Oh, not much bigger than the room you work in, but uh, they, they had uh, taken the front of the entrance and they had built a frame like this and they had taken ocotillo branches 
and shaved all the thorns off, and they wove them together as a mat and nailed it to the frame to fit the opening of this rock and then covered it with uh, with adobe. Yeah. And and made uh, they had built furniture and a whole, you, whole necessity uh, is the mother of invention, right? This well, has been they did, uh, invention. They invented it. So this yeah. has probably got to be the fastest half hour we've had. So we got to <laughs> do this again. We can do it again. And uh, I I think I've been, I've really enjoyed this immensely. And uh, Katie, I I truly appreciate what you're for doing this this morning. This has been really well, fun. You're welcome. And uh, I want to just remind people that Mojave Museum is an is a nonprofit museum, and we don't get federal funding, so we can need help. And if you want to volunteer here. We've got opportunities for you. So uh, I'm looking for a volunteer right now to help me out in artifacts, just a couple hours a week. Well, this is but a... But there's other, other opportunities, too. This would be good for... Uh, uh, good morning, Wolfgang. This would be good for anyone who wants to get involved in the community and have a little bit of fun, too. It is fun. Because it's there's... a good group of people that are here, too. I always talk with Andy about all the things he, you know, he turns up here and odds and ends and... Uh, a lot of people don't also realize for research here, you have one of the greatest photo archives I, I know of. It's amazing. And uh, not just Kingman photographs, mm -hmm. surprisingly, but, but a, a really strong photo archives here. So this has been good this morning. It's been very good. Well, come on out and visit us at the Mojave Museum of History and Arts here in Kingman. We're on, what was our, I don't even remember the address. Well, we're here. on Beale Street, just Beale. just right off around Beale the corner and, from Route 66, uh, at the end, west end of Locomotive Park, uh, just down the street from the Powerhouse Visitor Center. We're on Route 66, too. We're right on it. So right on. Uh, across from the jail. You can wa wa <laughs> wander around the museum a while and then walk across the bridge to Calico's restaurant. And We're close to everything. Yeah. We really are. We're close to, you can go, come down, have lunch, come on over, visit the museum. Here you can go over to uh, the Powers House uh, and Route 66 Museum and the Electric Car Museum are over there. Uh, but Benali House uh, over on, is that on Oak Street? Is it, I'm trying to remember. Uh, Spring. Spring Street. The Benali House over on Spring Street is also part of the museum. Yes. So be sure to go over there and visit visit that and see a beautiful house that belonged to a historic Kingman family. And uh, we furnish it right from here from the museum as much as we can. And we have as much as, I believe there's a lot of uh, original Benelli items over there too. So it's a beautiful house. I wouldn't mind living there myself. <laughs> oh, it is a beautiful, beautiful home. Absolutely beautiful. Miss Katie, thank you for doing this this morning and... Uh... Uh, thank, we'll thank Shannon for opening up, coming down here yeah. early and doing this for us. And this is this has been good. I've I've enjoyed this immensely, and you always pique my interest with goodies around here. So this I'll is just, fun. If we do it again, I'll have to remember which ones I already brought out. So. Well, we'll help you. We'll get uh, like I say. We'll talk about Polly, and we're overdue. We did one program a while back in the basement. Maybe we should do. We consider doing that we again. We can go down to the basement. There's not. There's a few new things down there, but I think there's uh, some some items that maybe we didn't pay much attention to that are are worthwhile looking at. Oh, good. Well, guys, thank you very much, and I uh, hope everybody has a nice Memorial Day weekend out there. Be safe, and uh, we'll do this again next week, and we'll uh, see what other kind of mischief and what we can turn up. Guys, thank you very much. Thank you.